Good morning. Thank you for joining us at our Passport to 2044 session on equity impact assessments and local comprehensive plans. We are really excited to be here today and be sharing the work that we've been doing at PSRC as well as other resources that are available. Today's session is the 13th in our Passport to 2044 series. So if you are unfamiliar with those, they are all available on our website. The recordings are on our agency YouTube, as well as all of the presentations and different links and resources. And I'll talk a little bit more about what those include later on. But these sessions are really meant for PSRC to help provide resources to support the local comprehensive plan process. We really want to help you have successful local plans uh, as we're working through um, this cycle. And really having those plans advance our regional goals around mobility, climate change, housing affordability, and racial equity. So as you can see here, the key policy themes from Vision 2050 are largely represented in our Passport to 2044 series, as well as the various resource and guidance documents we've been producing at PSRC. So a big emphasis on housing. We have two webinars on that that we previously recorded along with the State Department of Commerce. Um, on reducing greenhouse gas emissions and climate change, um, as well as the theme that this one is under, under equity, and really providing opportunities for all people. So as I mentioned, this is our 13th in the series, um, and we have one more planned on stormwater September 19th. The registration is available on our website, so you can find that there. We had a earlier session on equity back in November, which really focused on incorporating equity into local plans. So um, how do you develop different policies throughout the different elements of your plan, as well as community engagement for local plans. So that's a great resource that's available on our website, as well as corresponding guidance documents are there too. But for today, we are really happy to talk about equity impact assessments. We are going to start with an introduction to equity from Charles Patton, PSRC's Program Manager for Equity Initiatives and Policy. We're then going to talk about using equity impact assessments. So there are many tools that exist out there. We know that. We are joined by Ryan Kern from Race Forward, who will talk about um, equity impact assessment tools, as well as his work with the city of Seattle on using a tool for their last comprehensive plan update. Then we're going to show you PSRC's new tool that's specifically been created for local comprehensive plans in our region. And it's really meant to help focus down into specific policy areas or initiatives as part of your local comprehensive plan. We know that it can be really time consuming to do um, look at a full plan for this. So we're trying to help you look at things that might have the most impact. Then we'll have a Q&A. So please ask your questions um, in the Q&A box that you have available. And then we'll move over to breakout rooms and be able to practice the equity impact assessment. So if you're unable to join those breakout rooms, there will be a time um, after the Q&A for you to drop off uh, and not continue into those rooms. But we think these breakouts will be a really great opportunity to practice using the equity impact assessment tool, as well as connect with other planners or staff members from throughout the region who are working on local comprehensive plans. So a few logistics before we jump into it. The recording for today's meetings and all of the presentations will be shared with you after the meeting via email, and they'll also be available on our Passport website. All of the presentations are already there. So if you're looking for something or a link that's in one of these, that's where you can find them. You may need an updated version of Zoom to participate in today's breakout rooms. So if you end up not going to a breakout room, it might just be because your Zoom hasn't been updated recently. Uh, this is our first time using breakout rooms and Zoom webinars. So um, sorry if some of those logistics don't work around there but this is, we think it's going to be a great opportunity to be able to use them. As I mentioned, if you have a question, please ask it in the Q&A. And then if you um, stick around to the very end, you will be prompted to take our Title VI survey. Please do that. It really helps us understand the demographics of people who are joining our events, um, such as this one. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Charles Patton to talk about more broadly equity in our region and the work we're doing. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, I will share my screen and get us started. 
So good morning. Pleasure to be with you all. Thank you all for, for making the time. As Maggie mentioned, my name is Charles Patton. I'm the program manager for equity policy and initiatives here at PSRC. Uh, as you all know, today's presentation will be providing you with an overview of PSRC's new racial equity impact assessment, which we're really excited about. Um, and we'll also give you a sense of what other tools like this uh, look like and how they help incorporate equity into the work that you all do. But before we get into those presentations, I will be sharing a little bit about the importance of equity and why we were even moved to create a tool like this. Um, and before we do that, I'd love to have some poll questions, get a sense of your familiarity with tools like this and your comfort level with tools like this, just to um, get a foundation or do a, a little, um, um, I guess, groundwork ahead of time to get a sense of where you all stand related to uh, this tool. So first question I have for you, I have a basic understanding of tools like the racial equity impact assessment. Second question, I understand how tools like the racial equity impact assessment influence my work. And then the third question, I feel confident about my ability to use tools like the racial equity impact assessment in my work. And so I just wanna get a sense of where you all right, are right now related to these questions. And then we'll ask similar questions at the end of today's presentations. So it looks like most people were able to get those responses in. So Michaela, we can share the results. Um, so for the first question, I have a basic understanding of tools like the racial equity impact assessment. Uh, most people agree or strongly agree with that. There's a few that are neutral or disagree, which is completely fine. Hopefully at the end of today's presentation, you'll have a better understanding of tools like this. For the second question, I understand how tools like the racial equity impact assessment influence my work. Uh, looks like most people also under, have a good understanding of how it influences their work, which is fantastic. There's a few uh, that disagree, which hopefully will get you up to speed and you'll have a better understanding at the end of today. And then last question, uh, assessing your confidence using these types of tools. Uh, most people feel pretty confident. There's a few that are, are neutral, about a third uh, disagree. We'll get those third up to speed and hopefully you'll feel a lot more confident um, by the end of today's presentation. So thank you for taking that poll and I'll move us along. Uh, before we dive into the importance of equity, just wanna do a little level setting, uh, give you a, a sense of how we define equity at PSRC so we're all on the same page. Here you can see our definition. We define equity as when all people have the means to attain the resources and opportunities that improve their quality of life and enable them to reach their full potential when differences in life outcomes cannot be predicted by race or class or any other identity, and when communities of color, historically marginalized communities, and those affected by poverty are truly engaged in the decision-making in the decision -making process, uh, planning and policy-making process as well. So many of you are aware that our population is growing. As you can see on this slide, we're projected to move from about 4.3 million people to a little under 6 million people by 2050. And much of that growth is the result of a growing population of people of color. About a quarter of the region's population um, was represented by people of color in 2000. That number jumped up to almost a third uh, 10 years later in 2010 and surpassed 40% for the first time by the time 2021 rolled around. You can also note that in our region, about 15 cities are majority minority populations. And although uh, are we growing in diversity, we're becoming a more diverse region, uh, which is fantastic. We can also know that there's a clear difference, unfortunately, in how people experience the systems that we at PSRC help manage and shape based on their race. Opportunity mapping is a tool that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, it essentially illustrates which neighborhoods are rich in resources and which neighborhoods are not rich in resources, simply meaning which neighborhoods have access um, to quality schools, which neighborhoods have parks, which neighborhoods have living wage jobs. And this tool also assesses who has access to these areas um, and who has access to the resources in these areas. The slide that I'm sharing with you um, has some findings from the opportunity mapping resource. Uh, here you'll note that the people of color in our region are much less likely, unfortunately, to, to live in high opportunity communities. They're more likely 
to have an experience where they're further away from quality schools, they're further away from parks, they're further away from living wage jobs. You can also note that about six out of 10 of our American Indian, Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander households unfortunately live in these lower opportunity communities. Jurisdictions have begun to recognize the severity of disparities like the ones that I just shared with you and the need to address and incorporate equity into their plans, into their policies. Um, but they have also noted um, that there is currently a lack of clear mandates and relatively little guidance, best practices and tools to address these disparities that their communities are facing. And consequently, because of that, that lack of mandate and because of that lack of guidance, equity is often a secondary consideration if it's considered at all. So our hope is that the equity tools that we're creating at PSRC, including the racial equity impact assessment can help address some of these concerns that were raised by our members back in 2016 in this taking stock survey. Additionally, as many of you know, House Bill 1220 and the bipartisan infrastructure law are both requiring jurisdictions to be more thoughtful about equity issues and be more thoughtful about undoing harms that uh, our government agencies have created um, for marginalized communities, marginalized racial groups in our region and across um, the entire the entire state in some cases, enti entire country in some cases. Um, because of this, House Bill 1220 and the bipartisan infrastructure law, elected officials are probably asking you to incorporate and address equity in the work that you're doing. And if they haven't, they likely will um, in the very near future. So the equity tools that we're creating will hopefully make it a little easier for you to address those requests um, and incorporate equity more effectively in your policies and in your plans. So I've mentioned race quite a bit during those initial slides. I mentioned the experience of people of color in our region quite a bit. Some of you may be wondering why PSRC is leading with the race in this equity work. There is no neutral um, in this work that we're doing. Attempts to be race neutral and leave race out of these conversations have only led to continued barriers for communities of color with dis persistent disparities across any indicator you wanna look at, whether that's housing, whether that's economics, transportation, health, any indicator that you explore, you will unfortunately, unfortunately see severe disparities for people of color in our region. And these disparities are in large part a result of the history of government policies that have marginalized communities of color and continue to marginalize communities of color today, including redlining, restrictive covenants, urban renewal, and single family zoning. And here you can see some of the disparities that have resulted from that chain are, of policies uh, in the history of this region. We can note if we're looking at home ownership rates, you can see that about uh, two thirds of white residents own a home in our region. And that number is significantly lower when we're looking at people of color. About 25% of native Hawaiian Pacific Islander residents own a home in our region. When we look at median income, we can note that white residents earn a little over $90,000. That number is much lower for people of color. You look at American Indian, Alaska Native residents, they earn less than $50,000 in our region. And some people may look at those slides and say, isn't this really just about income? Wouldn't we, we, wouldn't we be able to address these issues just as effectively if we focused on income inequality rather than bringing race into this conversation? However, as we can see, in this chart that I'm sharing with you, even after controlling for household income, which simply, which simply means that we're evaluating differences in home ownership for households that are in the same income categories under $75,000, 75 to $149,000, we can see that home ownership rates for people of color are much lower than rates for white households, even when they are in the same income category. We essentially have income equality within each of these categories, but these racial disparities continue to persist. And I think this really highlights for me that if we truly want to address inequities in our region, we need to focus not only on income, but race as well. We can't address these racial inequities if we don't even know they exist. Focusing on racial equity and considering race in all the dimensions of our work not only provides us with the opportunity to address the unique circumstances of marginalized racial groups, the barriers that they're facing, but it also introduces a framework, it introduces tools, it introduces resources 
that can remove barriers for other marginalized groups. Uh, since our vision at PSRC is to have a region where everyone is thriving, regardless of their background, it's imperative that we improve outcomes for marginalized racial groups and close gaps so that race and other demographic factors do not continue to predict life outcomes, inform the trajectory of people's lives, determine who has access to what resources in our region. Uh, the concept of incorporating equity into planning is not new. We did not come up with this on our own at PSRC. This has been done for quite some time. Norman Krumholtz set a standard for equity in planning back in the 1970s, uh, shifting the role of planners to really be more uh, thoughtful um, about those who have few, if any, choices, addressing issues of poverty, disinvestment, uh, lack of economic opportunity, and prioritizing the needs of a growing population, um, African-American population in my hometown of Cleveland, Ohio, back in the 70s. Planners like Trump Holtz and the APA have released guidance uh, for quite some time to help more planners uh, more effectively incorporate equity into their work. And not only is there this rich history of, of equity and planning, but there's also a code of ethics um, that requires APA members to work to achieve economic, social, and as you can see, racial equity in their work. Today, uh, we have an opportunity to add to this rich, his rich history of weaving equity into planning with our regional equity strategy. The regional equity strategy, as some of you may know, is a suite of tools uh, that we're creating at PSRC to help elevate equity in the work that we do here and also help our member jurisdictions more effectively incorporate equity in the work that they do. Back um, before the pandemic in summer and fall of 2019, uh, staff at PSRC really undertook this informal scoping process. Uh, during these discussions, we chatted with board members, stakeholders, staff, community members' thoughts on issues related to equity, what was important to them related to this topic, and uh, what should the regional equity strategy include, and how should it address inequities in our region. The regional equity strategy will seek to ad address uh, the issues that were identified during these conversations, um, through the following four key component categories that I'm sharing with you on this slide that include capacity building, data and research, community engagement, and best practices. As you can see, our racial equity impact assessment, uh, which you all will be learning a little bit more about later on today, falls under the uh, category of best practices within under the umbrella of the regional equity strategy. This tool is designed to explicitly incorporate equity into the decision-making process for policies as well as plans. It's essentially a series of questions that are incorporated into the tool and it helps uh, uh, reduce inequities by encouraging the user to conduct community engagement to address potential blind spots that their agency or their jurisdiction might have, having a more holistic understanding of barriers and um, uh, what is communities are experiencing. Helps the user, um, you all identify gaps and disparities that communities may be experiencing and also helps you identify strategies to address those gaps and strategies to reduce those disparities moving forward. And it also encourages you as you're navigating and using the tool to develop a structure to hold yourself accountable and hold your jurisdiction accountable for this work moving forward. We obviously weren't the first uh, to create a tool like this. Many others have been created before. Uh, we created the racial equity impact assessment. Our tool was heavily influenced by tools that others have created, such as GARE uh, and the City of Seattle's Racial Equity Toolkit, which you'll learn a little bit more about later today. As you all know, PSRC reviews and certifies local comp plans. We have a checklist that you can see in the bottom left-hand corner that helps identify everything that we're looking for in this process. And this is where we determine if the equity elements that we're hoping to see are actually included in your plan. So this, the checklist is essentially a tool for local planners to understand what we're looking for broadly speaking. The regional equity strategy and tools that are incorporated into it like the racial equity impact assessment will provide additional information to help jurisdictions understand what we're expecting as it relates to equity, providing this extra level of detail to help inform how equity is actually woven into local plans. So although some of the regional equity uh, strategies resources are still on the horizon, they should be uh, coming to a close relatively soon. We have a number 
of equity related resources that are currently available on our website. You can find them using the links that I have for you on this slide. And now um, I will pass it over to Ryan Curran, uh, who's joining us from, from GARE or Race Forward. Uh, he'll share a little bit about, as I mentioned, Seattle's Racial Equity Toolkit, uh, which as I mentioned, also helped shape PSRC's new tool. All right, thank you, Charles, for uh, reiterating the, the case for racial equity and planning and doing some of that level setting and, and providing that introductory definition of a racial equity impact assessment. Um, I think my task here uh, today is to give an example of using a racial equity tool to integrate uh, equitable development policy framework in Seattle's 2035 comp plan and to launch uh, an implementation program that uh, stewarded those policies. Uh, and hopefully that will give you a better understanding of the possibilities of a toolkit uh, and leave you with a little more confidence that you you too can use it. Um, I will, as a caveat note that um, our Seattle process, uh, we went all in and we had a strong foundation to build from, but that the, the toolkit um, is designed to scale. And so for jurisdictions with less capacity or political will or um, you know, a hesitancy, like there's there's oper different points of entry and ways to scale it to, to really meet your need, but still um, surface and center uh, issues and considerations of racial equity. Um, so a uh, little introduction, I am uh, at Ryan Curran. I am the Housing, Land and Development Director for Race Forward. Race Forward is a national nonprofit. Uh, over the last 40 years, been working um, toward building a, a multiracial and just democracy. Um, so a big, big mission, big vision. Um, among other programs, we are home to GARE, the Government Alliance on Race and Equity. And that's a network of about 450 cities, counties, and regions that are committed to advancing racial equity. PSRC is a member. Um, and the GARE model is actually uh, modeled after Seattle's Race and just, so, Social Justice Initiative. So um, it's good to be back in the Northwest where some of these ideas um, around institutional change in government really took root. Uh, most recently, I was a um, planning manager at the city of Portland for an equitable um, TOD program. But before that, I was at the, at the city of Seattle at their office of housing, um, managing a community development program, and then um, had the opportunity to work with the planning department and the race and social justice initiative to apply this racial equity toolkit. Um, and co-found um, what became the, the city's equitable development initiative. So next slide is an example of what we actually produced. Um, our task was analyzing three growth alternatives for housing and jobs, um, the existing policies in the current comp plan for, for each chapter, and then proposing some implementation priorities. So we produced this analytical report around growth and equity, and then an implementation plan. Um, I mentioned a strong foundation earlier. The process occurred almost 10 years after RSJI was established in 2005, and 20 years after social, social equity was included as a core value in the 1994 comp plan. So strong foundation to start with. We also had a racial equity toolkit. It had been piloted on different topics, but never on land use or planning. Um, we had about four years of neighborhood planning updates that preceded it, and they were in Southeast and Central Seattle. So areas that were formerly redlined, disinvested, um, active gentrification and displacement occurring. So we had these um, local plans to, to draw from. The comp plan update occurred, uh, began in 2013, and it wasn't until a year later that the planning department partnered with the Race and Social Justice Initiative to apply the toolkit. And that toolkit was designed to go alongside the environmental impact statement, which, you know, as you all know, has a much longer history of, of practice. Um, so we ran alongside the EIS. Um, and I just say that timeline to indicate that, like, it, it's never too late to use a racial equity toolkit. It, there's, like I mentioned before, many points of entry. It's never too late and you can scale it. So you just have to pick a time to get started. A little bit about our capacity. Um, the two directors of the planning department and race and social justice initiative um, did convene other directors from departments to, to create an interdepartmental team. Um, and those were departments who had policies in 
uh, relevant to the comprehensive plan, so a broad team. Um, we also worked with some of our racial equity core teams that were in each department, and those, those are teams that um, you know manage the, ra the racial equity kind of programming or discussions in each each agency. Um, and the planning department contributed uh, data analysis and a policy staff for a year long process. So I got I got to work with um, Nora Liu and Nick Welch and, and a whole number of other just brilliant planners. Um, I was at the Race and Social Justice Initiative. Um, and was there for a full year, uh, were, and we contributed um, about $50,000 toward engagement of leaders from communities most impacted by displacement, and another $50,000 for some national support. So we actually brought in PolicyLink and Race Forward, and we you know, held a kickoff summit, and then like a closeout event that kind of was a call to action. So we had these kind of peak moments where we came together um, to draw attention to uh, the case that needed to be made and then the implications of, of uh, for implementation. So next slide is a summary of the entire process and the results. Um, we started with, you know, step one was what are your desired results uh, in the long term and in at the community level. And for us, it was both people in place, um, strong people, uh, resilient in the face of displacement, and strong communities and neighborhoods with access to opportunity um, throughout the city. Uh, our analysis of data included looking at areas of historical exclusion and amenity uh, richness, so these opportunity areas, as well as areas that had experienced uh, chronic disinvestment and were at, at risk of displacement. Our community engagement included resourcing a race and social equity task force, uh, and then really drawing on these existing community plans, which had, were just recently completed and were really rich in, in priorities and policy direction. Um, so our strategies citywide, we, uh, for racial equity, we created a uh, neighborhood typologies, um, which I'll share, uh, and those informed a more equitable growth scenario of those three growth alternatives. Um, some new equity policies throughout the entire comprehensive plan. We kind of actually used like a mini little racial equity toolkit worksheet for each chapter and had these kind of work sessions for each chapter. Um, led to a number of new policies in places we never anticipated. You know, utilities really took uh, took advantage of that opportunity to 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 think about how utilities and and traditional infrastructure really play a role, for example. Uh, and then an EDI program. Um, that was our, our main implementation tool, and I'll, I'll share what that looks like. Uh, our implementation plan included um, forming an ongoing capital cabinet to really navigate um, some of those contradicting policy directions um, and help you know resolve tensions as we implement. And, uh, and then there was actually funding provided for the Equitable Development Initiative for community projects, um, which, was, which was key, and I'll, I'll share a couple of examples. Our communications and accountability um, proposal was to do and actually launch a monitoring program um, with a data dashboard and you know uh, measures of of inequity and ongoing displacement risk, um, and so that program actually did did launch um, a couple of years later and is is ongoing, um, and then the EDI program itself was actually elevated to a division of planning, so it had a little more um, visibility and influence. So that's it in a nutshell, um, but I'm going to dig into each one. I will kind of loop back to this idea of, of what smaller jurisdictions can do when you're not, when you don't have this much capacity or you're not going all in. Again, you can narrow it, perhaps pick a chapter or a couple of key chapters that are important to communities of color and have been identified as priorities. Um, some of the data that we had to kind of create from scratch is actually available to you now. PSRC has created these tools for you. Um, so uh, opportunity, displacement risk, like all those um, indices are kind of off the shelf and ready. Uh, everyone who has to do engagement, you can be more targeted in, in your engagement um, and use your in-house resources uh, that are uh, free, right? Like you can be more transparent uh, about where decisions are made and, and how community can influence decision making. Like those are uh, tools that, that you have available now. Um, and then also measuring progress and communicating transparently is, you know, just good practice, right? It's not, it's not just a a, a racial equity practice. It's it's actually just good governance and, and good planning. 
So what happened? Uh, next slide is uh, an impact uh, list of kind of what what changed. Um, the toolkit led to um, an urban village typology that directed comparatively less growth to high displacement risk areas and more to high opportunity areas. A caveat there is that those those high opportunity areas um, were narrowly defined as the ones with um, good transit. So it was more of like, where is the transit going that led to that? But um, nonetheless, those, those concepts took hold and influenced actually where we um, were distributing housing and job growth. Uh, the equity policies I mentioned were included throughout all chapters, not just uh, land use and growth. And we had an implementation plan um, with priorities for this uh, equitable development initiative to fund community-led projects. Um, next slide is, let's go into each kind of step. So this the idea of crafting some desired results and outcomes um, really helped us to communicate those outcomes and orient and commit the analytical process to equity focused goals up front. Uh, so we, you know, we design those to advance racial equity and, and minimize harmful impacts for communities of color. And we talked about those results as those end conditions in the community, which we aim to impact and have, you know, have a reasonable ability to influence. So these were written in pencil and we were, um, you know, come back to really solidify those in the plan. And we were lucky to draw from existing plans and policy documents that communities of color had already created, right? We didn't have to, to guess. And what that looked like for us was uh, a vision for both people and place, um, you know, where Seattle is diverse and all people thrive regardless of race and means and neighborhoods are diverse and include community anchors, supports, goods, services, and amenities that lead to healthy lives and flourish. Um, and that meant community stability and resilience in the face of displacement and really great neighborhoods throughout the city with equitable access for all. Um, and that that sounds, you know, it's pretty compelling and um, inspiring, uh, but there was some new concepts in there around uh, people and place. Like it's not just the built environment. We're talking about uh, the quality of life for people in, you know, the next 20 plus years in Seattle. Um, so that was new. Our data, um, Next slide is a little bit about you know the questions we asked. What what was the data that was important to us, and what did it say? Um, for us, it was collecting and analyzing data to show which inequ inequities exist, to what degree, and who is experiencing the worst of those inequities. And the purpose was really to change the information informing the comp plan, right? Similar to how EIS uh, practices, and, you know, really put a sharp focus on environmental impact. Um, we wanted to surface systemic inequities and really focus, again, on people, not just the built environment. It also helped us understand historical context of racial injustice related to growth to really look at some of the root causes of disparities and which communities were harmed. So we looked at redlining, covenants, predatory lending, banking, public disinvestment, um, and it really changed our historical reference. So what that looked like was um, some new indices of displacement risk and access to opportunity. Um, these are pretty familiar now, much more popular, but you know we were the first to really use them in a planning project. Uh, and it again, the typology of, of uh, combining these two really helped um, change how our growth targets were distributed throughout um, the final growth alternative. The risk index itself um, here, an example of it, it shows areas of high and low displacement risk. Red indicates high risk, blue indicates low. And our conclusion was that displacement risk is concentrated um, in, and the trends will continue uh, in most growth scenarios, you know, especially the status quo. So um, this was the first time we really had like a visual description of something that, uh, you know, communities have been telling the this, this city for, for generations, really. The... Other index was our op access to opportunity index. Um, it was made of kind of these key determinants of physical, social, and economic well-being. Um, again, green indicates those areas with a high level of access to opportunity, and brown is low low access. And the conclusion was that access to amenities was unevenly distributed, with communities of color really excluded from quality parks, edu quality education, transit. And that that also would continue under status quo growth scenarios. So we needed to do uh, and plan differently. Um, so our data was helping us, but um, 
our community engagement was most critical. Uh, we were committed, committed to a different, uh, more meaningful strategy of engagement, um, which again started with kind of targeted engagement uh, with communities most impacted by historic redlining and and the recent foreclosure crisis at the time it was recent. Um, and our purpose was really to change our the city's relationship with communities of color and, and shift power. Um, so more of a, of a discretionary relationship with communities. Uh, and that started with um, asking this question about stability as we grow and prosper and the tensions there and really offering the best of what government has to offer. Um, so early information to increase understanding of what the plan can do and how decision making actually works and where decisions are really made. Um, resourcing, like financial resourcing. Um, I mentioned that 50,000 up front for this long-term engagement of historically underrepresented um, populations. So leaders from communities that uh, were, were fighting displacement were brought together and really um, shaped the direction of our, our policy conversations um, and hosted their own events. So we created uh, another resource was just access to decision makers. Like when communities host an event, talk about the comp plan, we, we did our part to bring, to, you know, the mayor, to bring council members, to get direct um, conversation between those most impacted and those with formal decision making. So our strategies, um, next slide is a, a little bit about what, you know, what do you do about it, right? Uh, who, who been, what are you proposing? Who benefits? Who's burdened? Um, what commitments to, to change are you making? Um, and again, we were able to pull a lot of these from existing um, plans that were emerging from and vetted by communities of color. Um, and so we were fortunate to take a lot of those priorities and, and this vision for strong communities and strong people to develop this kind of equity policy framework um, that was embedded both in the growth and land use chapter, but also throughout the plan. Um, so policies around preventing displacement, promoting economic opportunity, um, building on cultural assets, uh, focusing on transportation um, improvements for those uh, transit dependent communities, not just commuters, um, and planning for community health uh, more holistically around parks and healthy food and safe environments. Um, and then also leveraging private development to fill gaps in amenities and expand the supply and variety of housing um, throughout the city. So throughout the Throughout the plan, throughout the use of the racial equity toolkit, we kept asking um, about implementation and who, you know, then what? Like, where, where will be the home for this work? Who would wake up each day caring about it? Um, fortunately, we had worked with our city council to pass legislation prior to adopting the plan that made racial equity a, a core value of the update updated plan and directed us to bring an implementation plan uh, to institutionalize community priorities. Uh, so we wrote one. Uh, the plan said, you know, not just what the city is going to do, but with whom and how much it'll cost and how it'll be paid for, um, and led to the launch of the Equitable Development Initiative as an ongoing program of the city. And this was really critical to get to show this early commitment before adopting this longer term comp plan growth strategy, because, um, you know, near term priorities are what people want to talk about. Uh, and that's and we honored that conversation and then followed up with with investments. So here are a couple projects that got some early investment. Um, uh, the William Gross Center in the Central District is now open. It's a repurposed fire station, providing spaces for workforce and business development for the Black community. Uh, Othello Square in Southeast was a publicly owned uh, property near light rail with um, and now has an open health center and low income home home ownership housing and, and hopefully a future multicultural center and community college facility. Um, other projects like the little Saigon landmark project and the ID is now just getting funded I, my, is my understanding and the food innovation district in Rainier Beach just got site control. So these were really, you know, these are tangible projects that, uh, you know, may have just never been a priority. Uh, or would have been delayed priorities, but um, this this implementation framework and the funding behind the EDI really helped accelerate the community's priorities. Uh, accountability and communication ongoing, um, kept an eye on that always. Uh, thinking about um, how to also deepen the relationship with communities um, th throughout implementation, so it doesn't just become a uh, kind of a transactional relationship. 
with projects. Uh, and for us, that was, you know, the EDI, um, you know, the, the, the equitable development initiative, um, is the nation's first anti-displacement program in a city planning department dedicated to investing in communities of color led projects and has invested over a hundred million to date in capital projects, but also capacity building, um, community capacity building and has attempted to hold the integrity of where the, the community holds a vision and sets priorities through an advisory group that informs funding decisions. Um, and then I mentioned earlier the monitoring program uh, as a way to continue to report on these, you know, the data. What does the data, what does the data show? Are we actually uh, moving toward a more equitable future, or have, are we? Is it are we still back backsliding? Um, so the policy framework is now, you know, much more normalized uh, than what I mentioned around displacement and, and opportunity. Uh, these are common tools. It's been used in other policy conversations. Uh, and it, I think it will continue to live on like that. The, the, these ideas have taken root um, and are really migrating to other policy conversations, which is, which is hopeful. So it was a powerful process. Um, it really helped us renew and clarify a vision for racial equity and, and our roles, both the institution's role and the community's role in kind of co-planning for the future. Um, and now, you know, the planning field has a, this proven tool for racial equity planning. It's, it is a new muscle and much like the early days of the environmental impact statements, um, you'll need to grow this uh, familiarity and confidence, but we know it's possible. And fortunately for y'all, PSRC is providing many of the um, off the shelf resources for you to successfully use the racial equity impact assessment. So you don't have to make it up as you go. And like everything, you don't have to do it alone. Uh, it is always easier if we all work together to raise this, this standard for the planning field. Um, so I hope that you all feel free to reach out. Um, GARE is a resource for you. Um, please do bring your challenges and, and your wins to share with peers across the country using these new practices. Uh, there's a, a link in the slide here of a resource and contact info to register for GARE has a housing land and development network group. Um, so planners and housing policy and affordable housing practitioners throughout all the 450 members in the GARE network are gathered to, to talk about um, how to advance these practices and you're invited to join. So with that, I will pass it to Grant Gibson. Thanks, Ryan. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Grant Gibson. I'm a planner in the data department here at PSRC, uh, and I am the staff lead for the uh, project group that developed the racial equity impact assessment that we're going to talk about today. Uh, so you've heard a lot already from Maggie and Charles and Ryan, so we're just going to do a brief review to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Uh, as Charles said before, uh, the racial equity impact assessment is part of PSRC's regional equity strategy. It is under the banner of best practices that orange there on the right of your screen. Um, and as previously stated, it is one of several tools that we've made available and works in concert with many of those tools that PSRC has made. Again, the question of what exactly is a racial equity impact assessment? Uh, we see it as both a product and a process uh, that is really designed to have explicit consideration of racial equity in decision making, uh, which works to reduce racial inequities across all groups and improve success for those groups. As we've mentioned before, as you've seen already, uh, our equity impact assessment is not the only one that exists. There are many others. So why did we go about making our own? Uh, well, a big part of that is during the scoping process for a Vision 2050 plan, we were asked directly to create strategies and tools to help local jurisdictions uh, consider racial equity and help mitigate some of the disparities that are seen in our region. And so we created 
the racial equity impact assessment focus directly on the comprehensive planning process to provide a resource for local jurisdictions here. Um, this is part of uh, the regional equity strategy. And so we co-created this assessment with our equity advisory committee. And a big thing that we heard in working with them on the assessment is that they really wanted us to have a strong implementation of training for how to use this. And so that's why we're all here today. So this slide is a little timeline we put together. At the top uh, in the orange banner, you're gonna see sort of the normal comprehensive plan development process. And then below that uh, are the different steps of our racial equity impact assessment. And so you can see how the assessment itself uh, spans the entirety of the comprehensive plan development process. Uh, we start with this step of early inclusive engagement it itself is a, a scoping exercise. It fits in well with that early plan scoping step. We move on to data development analysis in the planning process. And then our first three steps uh, start with that. They overlap into that third step of plan development where we also have our fourth step. That yellow chevron you see at the orange bar at the top marks formal comprehensive plan adoption. And so after adoption has happened, you get into plan implementation, which is where our steps five and six live. Um, as we've said before, uh, it's not too late to start. Uh, wherever you are currently in the comprehensive plan development process, you can go ahead and start using this assessment to help the work that you're already doing. Um, and as Ryan mentioned too, we really created this so that we can help narrow in on specific policies or policy areas. Uh, so if your resources are limited, if your time is limited, you don't have to make an attempt to do everything all at once. You can really hone in on a specific policy or a pair of policies by using this assessment process. Uh, so as Charles mentioned earlier, we really used as inspiration um, and as the, the framework for our assessment, uh, GARE's Racial Equity Toolkit. So when I go through the steps, you might experience a little bit of deja vu with what you saw with Ryan's presentation, um, but that's fine because we're gonna show you some examples of how we go through each step. If you were to look at the document itself, the bulk of the document is a detailed worksheet that has steps and questions that you can actually fill out within the document itself. Um, it's available on our website in a Microsoft Word document format, as well as a PDF. Uh, there's also a couple of summary checklists in the document that you can use uh, just to sort of keep track of where you are in the process. Or once you feel comfortable and you may not need the whole worksheet, you can just use the checklist to, to mark your progress. Uh, and for each step of uh, the steps in the worksheet, we have this box you see here on the right. Uh, of guidance and resources. So at the top, you're going to have uh, some text that provides some guidance on what the step is, uh, what you should be considering in the step, what you should um, consider when answering the questions for the step. And then the bottom are lists of resources. These are going to be links to resources that either PSRC has and hosts on our website, or resources from different organizations that live elsewhere. Um, and they will be specific and relevant to each step in the process. Uh, and so now we're gonna go through all the steps in our uh, racial equity impact assessment using some examples. So the first step of the process um, you saw uh, aligns with plan scoping, mentioned that it itself is sort of a scoping exercise and that's the uh, early inclusive engagement, we sometimes call it step zero. And it's really asking you, what sort of community engagement have you done and what have you learned from that community engagement? That community engagement could be things like summer fairs, focus groups with different demographic groups, community surveys. Uh, and so from that, you should get some, some key issues that will help you focus in on um, policies that you might want to implement to uh, focus on racial equity and reduce uh, racially inequitable impacts in your communities. 
for our exercise today, we're going to focus on parts. So the first step is to uh, identify and develop a proposal to put in your comprehensive plan to address uh, a particular area, in this case, parks, and identify the outcomes you want. And so in this case, with parks, we're going to say that we want to have parks within walking distance of all residences in our city or jurisdiction. And in doing so, we're going to prioritize underserved communities first that don't have the same park access as other communities. The next step is focusing on gathering information, uh, gathering information and data. And so you'll look at things like racial demographics, uh, other demographics of the people that live in your city or jurisdiction, and also try to determine what sorts of benefits and impacts in the short term and long term that you might see. And so with our parks example, we're seeing that um, areas with limited parks in our jurisdiction are about 70% people of color. And some of those short term impacts uh, in those communities are going to be some construction impacts. Step three is about further community engagement. And so then what this is asking is that based on the information that you've gathered in the previous step, uh, then how, how do you go about doing community engagement to get additional information, additional perspective and experience uh, from community to help develop strategies in the next step? And so what we've seen with our community engagement is that uh, some of these underserved communities that we're prioritizing for park building first, um, they're going to have some benefits of more open space. But communities there also have concerns about increased traffic volumes and possible gentrification and new parks coming in. Step four is then where you hone in on specific strategies uh, to help put your plan proposal into action. And so this table you see here is taken directly out of um, our document, out of the worksheet. Um, and it's just a resource that you can use uh, if you prefer to lay out your strategies. You can use whatever other resource works best for you. But you can see that we have areas for the strategy itself, what actions need to happen to implement the strategy, who's going to be responsible, uh, what your timeline, your deadlines are going to be, and then uh, resources needed. And so one thing that we do want to stress here and also in the document itself is that this step number four is the last step before that formal comprehensive plan adoption happens. So we really um, identify the need to, once you've developed some strategies, re-engage with community, see if the strategies you develop line up with what the community is asking for. Maybe you need to go back and get more data, tweak some things here and there, develop some new strategies, edit some existing ones. Um, so then you have the best strategies possible to move forward into plan adoption. After plan adoption happens, the yellow chevron and the slide I showed earlier, then we move into plan implementation process and our fifth step which is all about accountability and communication. And so some of the questions that are being asked in this step are things uh, like, are your other plans, like a transportation plan, a housing strategy, uh, are those things in alignment with the comprehensive plan that you just working on with this assessment to make sure that your strategies and proposals to improve racial equity are consistent across everything that you're doing? It's also asking about uh, your communication strategies with community. Um, we don't want you to just you know, drop away from community engagement. Uh, this really should put into practice a, a continued um, habit of, engage of engagement with communities. Um, and so we're asking about what other strategies are you working on to improve that communication, continue communication as you're doing implementation of these things in your plan. The final step, step six, uh, really happens after some time of plan implementation where um, the plan is adopted, projects are in motion, things are happening on the ground. And so it's asking questions like, are you achieving 
the anticipated outcomes that you said you wanted in at the very first part of this process, step one. Uh, have there been unintended consequences that no one uh, really foresaw happening? Uh, how are you changing course or modifying your actions to get those anticipated outcomes happening um, to mitigate those unintended consequences? And then how are you continuing that genuine community engagement throughout the course of plan implementation? And so that's it. Step six is the last part of our racial equity impact assessment. Um, what's next for us here at PSRC? Uh, so like I said, the document is available on our website. Um, you will get this PowerPoint presentation in your email later after we're done here today. If you click on that link right there, that will start a direct download of the Word version of the assessment from our website. You can use the Word version um, to just directly type in and add in things uh, if you yourself while you're using it. Uh, after today, if there are uh, local staff here or staff that you know that want to work with us more on additional training, additional support um, on how to use this assessment, we're available to do that. Uh, and also just going back to what uh, Ryan said at the end of his presentation, GEAR has the Housing Land Development Network. We encourage you to check it out. Um, it's always great to have a social resource to help uh, with doing new things like this. And so that's it for me today. Thanks again for being here. And we're going to turn back to Charles for some Q&A. Thank you, Grant. Thank you, Ryan, both for your fantastic presentations. I see that there is one question in the chat, and I believe this question is for Ryan. If you have a, another question, feel free to ask, but we'll start with our first question. And Ryan, uh, the question is, how valuable and how accessible slash difficult were GIS tools in making and explaining the plan? Did planning folks get special training in GIS tools? Um, yeah, I think I, I mentioned that we had to create some of those tools from scratch uh, and we're just lucky that we had a had hired a new planner with GIS skills uh, who came from a, a graduate program where, where he had, this is Nick Welch uh, in, in the city of Seattle, who had, um, he had uh, played with these concepts before of, of indices around uh, gentrification and displacement risk. And then we also had um, uh, John Powell's work around opportunity mapping to draw from. So there, there was some examples, but they hadn't been um, created for Seattle and they hadn't been applied um, together to create that typology. So uh, we, we kind of had to make it up as we went and the GIS technical skills uh, came in-house. Um, and, and so that's, you know, when I look at what PSRC offers off the shelf, I'm just envious. Like it's right there ready for you to, to draw from. Um, and so, uh, but other, other GIS layers within that, uh, yeah, they do require a fair bit of technical skills. So we just had another question pop into the chat, and then you might be able to give some insight on this one too, Ryan. Uh, can you please share cities that have successfully used the racial equity toolkit and have made significant changes to their plans based on the toolkit? I'm, I'm curious about uh, folks that have used GARE's example, um, GARE's racial equity toolkit that, that might be members um, or partners with GARE that you can kind of reference and reflect on that have had some success with this. Yeah, the, the many of the elements of these toolkits, you know, they're all designed to be together uh, to to have the most impact. Um, but many of the elements of toolkits have been applied to a number of comprehensive plans. Um, Carborough, North Carolina, has a good racial equity framework in its comp plan, um, and had to go through an analytical process and kind of look at benefits and burdens and do engagement in in many of the ways we're talking about. Um, we are uh, I'm hopeful in the Maryland, Virginia, DC area, the, uh, the, um, the COG there is hosting uh, an event this fall to help all the jurisdictions, again, use a, a racial equity toolkit on their comp plan. So there's kind of actually like a, a wave currently of jurisdictions that all seem to be on a similar timeline. Um, same in, the, in California around their housing elements. Um, 
it's it's an interesting time in planning. I'm I'm be curious at the next APA concert or uh, conference how uh, uh, how some of the impact will be of using these toolkits on plans will be communicated out. Uh, I'll think of some more and send you a list. Yeah, great. <laughs> I'm thinking of a, a couple in our region. I know we've been chatting with folks across the region. Grant and Maggie, I'm curious if the names of those member jurisdictions come to mind of our folks that have been using uh, similar tools and how they've incorporated into their work. Either of you have those names come to mind? Uh, yeah, we, so part of the, the uh, early development that we did for this project was that we looked at some existing tools out there um, locally and a little bit farther away. So we saw that there are uh, existing tools that City of Redmond has that they use. Um, King County has its own uh, racial equity toolkit. Uh, we also heard from uh, working with our equity advisory committee that uh, City of Bellevue apparently has some sort of equity toolkit they use as well. So there are local examples from some bigger jurisdictions like Seattle and the County of Bellevue. Um, yeah, I'm not personally aware of any others, um, but I'm sure there's some in the development. I'll, I'll share two more. Um, we used a, a, health, a health equity toolkit very similar, but brought in a health a health element to it for a uh, town center plan in Southwest Portland. Um, and that had a very similar impact and had many of the same elements. Um, I can drop a link on that and that. And then Arlington County, Virginia just used, um, actually kind of piloted their racial equity toolkit on a, a, a pretty juicy plan, which was um, essentially getting rid of single family zoning throughout the county, um, the missing middle. Uh, proposal, um, and I can drop that in the in the chat too. If folks want to see how they they took a kind of traditional um, needs, uh, what was it like a, a background and needs assessment process, and and integrated the racial equity toolkit into it, kind of like what we did with the EIS, like they ran alongside a, a traditional analytical process, but enhanced it um, and led to a, a much more robust missing middle policy that just just passed. It's fantastic. Um, the next question, um, I feel like I might be able to answer the first question, but there's a, several other questions that I might not be able to answer. Um, I'm curious if Maggie might be able to help me out, uh, but I know Liz underwood Boltman was a big part of this, and um, she is in the audience, but I don't know if she can answer. Um, uh, the question is, there was a mention about a survey for 2016. This was the taking stock survey that's being referenced. Uh, who was surveyed, what was the survey about, and do you have the theme to share with us? Or was there another survey done since the 2016 survey to teach us lessons learned? Thank you. Um, so this was a survey done by PSRC. Uh, we were surveying our, our member jurisdictions, and I see Maggie popped up, so I'll see if you can help me out with this response. Yeah, so this survey, Taking Stock, done in 2016, was directly after um, the 2015-2016 comprehensive planning cycle. So it was a review of um, an assessment of how that cycle went, as well as the resources and guidance that PSRC provided. So that's how we've used it from PSRC's end to really inform the update to Vision 2050, as well as determining the guidance that we are sending forward now to support the 2024 comprehensive plan update. So it wasn't specific to equity, but that was obviously a big theme in it. Thank you, Maggie. Um, next question we have is related to parks. I'm not sure if Erica might be able to help me out with this one. Are there any parks planning departments present today? I personally feel part of the problem is that cities do not incentivize staff to live in the community they work for. They do not see people who don't have cars to drive to, to, the, to the parks, for example, schlucking groceries to apartment buildings. Is that um, any part of the plan? Could you repeat the first part of the question? Sure. Are there any parks planning departments present today? I personally feel part of the problem is that cities do not incentivize staff to live in the community they work for. Um, I think that's a good point. I don't actually see the list of participants, but um, I would hope that there might be some parks planners a lot of times in the smaller jurisdictions 
um, they're embedded in the part, uh, planning department. So um, I think that's a great point and something to look at. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. Uh, I, I think we're at time, unfortunately, so I won't be able to answer uh, the other questions. So I will move us along. Uh, thank you for your questions. Really appreciate that. I'll share my screen and get us ready for these breakout sessions. Um, so Michaela will be moving you all into breakout rooms. Uh, you'll be able to practice, as we mentioned, using the racial equity impact assessment and this kind of hypothetical planning exercise. Uh, if you cannot participate completely fine, uh, please log off so that Michaela can get an accurate count so that she can move you all into those breakout rooms. Uh, once again, thank you for joining us. Hope you enjoyed the session and you learned something um, that will help you with incorporating equity uh, using this tool moving forward. Uh, for those that will be sticking around, uh, you and your group will answer a few questions from the assessment that we have hand selected um, as if you were updating a plan for the region in this hypothetical exercise. We use the region for this hypothetical exercise because we obviously have readily available data at this scale. Um, we also didn't want to put the spotlight on any one particular jurisdiction. So uh, hopefully you don't get caught up on the scale of region versus city or region versus county for any of these questions. The region can serve as the city level scale if that makes the exercise a little bit uh, easier to navigate. Uh, each question you'll note includes instructions that will hopefully help you answer those questions. You'll see slides like this in the slide deck that we'll be sharing with you and they'll have a question. Then right above it will be instructions to help you answer that question. We've also included various resources and suggestions like the ones that you're seeing on this slide right now. Uh, these are hopefully going to just help you spark ideas, get some wheels turning, for your group about potential responses. But in many cases, we hope that you don't feel limited by these suggestions, but they can just kind of spur some conversation. Uh, you can find and download the slide deck for your breakout rooms uh, using our website, but Maggie will be sharing, you, uh, sharing with you a direct link in the chat uh, where you will be able to click on that link, get the slide deck and be able to answer those questions with your team. So that will be your reference document throughout this breakout exercise. Uh, here you're looking at the agenda slide, which I believe is included on slide number two of the slide deck. It includes some guidance for your breakout discussions. You'll note that the person with the last name uh, that is closest to A will serve as your facilitator for the group. Um, obviously, if someone else steps up to volunteer, that's completely fine. But just to streamline the process and hopefully get the ball rolling, person with the last name closest to A will serve as your facilitator. Uh, so I hope you had a uh, enjoyable time in your breakout rooms. I had some uh, a fantastic group, very thoughtful responses to the questions. Really enjoy being a part of those conversations. I believe Brian and Grant were also in some groups. So I'm going to uh, ask them to to share some reflections on what they heard in the the four minutes that we have left with you all. Yeah, uh, I think the first thing. Um, yeah. I would breakout room I was in uh really great um you know lots of discussion we managed to get through all three questions which is fantastic um and uh some some key themes that I would say that I heard is that um you know it's it's easy to kind of do what you've done before um you know and go about planning the way that uh, you've done before, but then when we are explicitly looking at race, you know, that takes a little bit of extra work, um, you know, and takes, I think, a little more uh, forethought, right, to, to look at those things, because um, it's, I think, right, like, like Ryan mentioned earlier, it's exercising a new muscle, um, and it doesn't come easy at first. Uh, Something else that I saw in my breakout room is that, uh, you know, that the, there's a great insight that some some of the breakout room attendees had where, you know, hey, here's some data that we're looking at. In this case, it's demographic data from the U.S. Census Bureau. Um, and we can tell that it's not telling the whole story. You know, so, so we probably want to disaggregate some of this data we're getting. How can we do that? Maybe we need to go back to community. Right, and then yeah, and engage more with community to get more of the story. Uh, so yeah, we great time. Fantastic! So glad that you were able to have a good conversation and work through 
uh, those questions. Um, I had a, another um, fantastic experience. One thing that came up was this slide that was included in your breakout sessions um, of the breakout room slide deck. Uh, they noticed that even when we're looking at the highest income earners for Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander alone, uh, their home ownership rate is similar to that of uh, white alone households that are in the lowest income category, which was striking for a number of folks that were in my room. Um, and I think that data kind of informed this desire um, for when we're looking at strategies to help those that are most in need and that are most marginalized. So I thought that was an interesting kind of microcosm of how we can use this tool to identify uh, where there are severe burdens and barriers and uh, start to really focus our strategies on these most marginalized groups. So that was really interesting to see in this short period of time that we were able to spend together. Um, I also thought there were some creative ideas about converting office space to low income home ownership opportunities, really being innovative about the current state of where we are post pandemic and how we could potentially leverage that to uh, help address our, our uh, uh, severe need uh, for home ownership. So uh, really innovative ideas, really thoughtful responses, really reflecting um, not only on current disparities, but also looking at uh, historical disparities. I thought there were some interesting conversations about how history has informed these disparities. Now do a shameless plug right now. We have our new Legacy of Structural Racism interactive report available on our website that provides uh, an overview of that history, the overview of racist policies specifically in our region and how that has informed disparities today. So really interesting to hear those conversations about how history informs current disparities and what we can do to address that. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you all again for your, your thoughtful responses and working through those questions. I hope it was helpful. I hope this um, makes this uh, uh, the use of this tool a little bit less onerous and a little bit easier to, to work out that muscle and develop that muscle so that it becomes more natural moving forward. I truly enjoy my time and I, I look forward to chatting with you all in the future. So I'll pass it over to Maggie. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Charles. So thank you all for joining us today at our Passport to 2044 session. As I mentioned, the recording for today's session will be available on our YouTube and all of the PowerPoint presentations are currently available on our website. We do have a few poll questions. Just to see, just to get feedback on today's session um, and to feel, see how you're feeling about equity impact assessment tools now that you've kind of had some time to dig into it. So please answer these questions. And as a reminder, we are also um, going to prompt you to take our Title VI survey at the end of this, it's just asking some demographic questions so we have a better idea of who's attending our events um, and who we're reaching out to for these. So thank you so much. Thank you for joining and have a great day.